Many people have become recognized for being the first to do something, but many of those excelled not because their goal was to be the first, but simply because they had a passion for what they were doing. Janet Guthrie was the first woman to qualify for and compete in both the Indianapolis 500 and the Daytona 500, along with many other racing firsts. But her goal was not necessarily to be the first woman to do anything. Like any other driver on the track, her goal was to be the best. Janet Guthrie faced many obstacles in her career, and yet her career became legend because of her brilliance, her persistence, and her passion. And Janet Guthrie's career deserves to be remembered. Guthrie was born in Iowa City, Iowa on March 7, 1938, the oldest of five children. Her parents were both pilots, and the family moved to Florida when she was three years old when her father took a job with Eastern Airlines. It isn't surprising, given who her parents were, that she learned to fly at a young age and earned her pilot's license at just the age of 17. It seems I was born adventurous and grew up insufficiently socialized, Guthrie said. At 16, she jumped off the wing of her father's plane with a parachute. She went to college in Michigan and ultimately earned a degree in physics in 1960. She called flying her first love, but her flying license wasn't particularly useful as a career, as airlines at the time wouldn't hire a woman pilot. She got a job with Republic Aviation as an aerospace engineer in New York, working on projects that were precursors for the Apollo program. She wanted to be an astronaut because it seemed like the greatest adventure the 20th century had to offer, but in 1964 she was rejected after applying for the Scientist Astronaut Program because she lacked a PhD, though she got through the first round of eliminations. She was brilliant. She had both a good career and a good education. But then she found something that she found to be more interesting. Motorsports. She got a hold of a Jaguar XK140, and her first introduction to racing came from amateur sports car races in parking lots. In 1963, at the age of 25, she started racing in the Sports Car Club of America, which that year had begun holding professional races in addition to amateur ones. Living in New York, she competed in a variety of regional races, autocrosses, hill climbs, and field trials. One of her friends said that all of Janet's money was spent on racing, which she did on the weekends while working. She moved to national races with her Jaguar, and by 1972 she had given up her aerospace career to race full-time. During her SCCA days, she built her own engines and towed her racing cars in a station wagon she bought for $45. She drove around the country, sleeping in her car at night and racing by day. She wasn't able to find much in the way of sponsorship or funding and poured all of her resources into maintaining her own cars. She had no crew and did everything herself. It was doable, she said, if the desire was strong enough, if anything is doable. She cleaned herself up before the races to look as if she was just as rich as the rest of my competitors. She built her engines, wearing two pairs of gloves to keep her manicure as perfect as she could make it. In 1973, she won the SCCA North Atlantic Road Racing Championship in a Toyota Celica. She also won a couple of Sebring-class races. By 1976, she'd been racing for 13 years and had given her all to racing, when she was contacted by a man she'd never heard of, Rolla Volstead. Volstead was a longtime team owner and car builder and among the last of the low-budget independent teams. Rolla Volstead was widely considered to be one of the most influential race car designers of the 20th century. He had pioneered the concept of putting the engine in the rear of the car. He too was driven by passion and had built his first car in his basement, and Guthrie had caught his interest. He told People magazine in 1976, I wanted to satisfy my own aspiration of being the first to enter a woman at Indy. I asked around for the top female driver and everyone answered, Janet Guthrie. For her part, Guthrie was quoted in Reed Magazine in March of 2018. I had no house, only a used up race car, no money, no jewelry, no husband. Then the phone rings and a man I never heard of asked me if I want to take a test in an Indy car. He invited her to test a car and attempt to qualify for the 1976 Indianapolis 500. And she took 15th in her first Indy car race at Trenton on May 2nd. She hadn't expected that her attempt to qualify would be a big deal. By her own admission, she'd been in male-dominated fields her whole life and never felt that her gender had gotten in her way. But her entry into the trials made big news, and all of her previous racing experience and wins seemed to mean nothing. The only thing the newspapers cared about was that she was a woman. The newspapers intimated that the male drivers threatened to boycott if she was allowed to drive and called her entry a stunt, saying that women racers are a joke. What's that you say? A woman going to drive in the 500? They quoted drivers who were saying that she was going to kill us all. She ought to be home having babies. And that the very idea of her racing was idiotic. 
Guthrie was stunned by the outpouring of vitriol, and she had never experienced that before. But the car that she was racing in had mechanical problems and ultimately failed to qualify. But she did do a few laps in one of legendary driver A.J. Foyt's cars, reaching an impressive 181 miles per hour. If she'd had a better car, she may well have qualified that year. She was invited, however, to start racing in an entirely different kind of car racing. Stock car racing. She became the first woman to compete in a NASCAR Winston Cup Super Speedway race, coming in 15th in the World 600 race. It was the first time she'd ever been to a stock car race, and she beat her detractors who thought that she wouldn't be strong enough to handle the big, heavy beast that were stock cars. The following season, she raced in the Daytona 500, reaching 9th place before her car's engine blew two cylinders, and she finished 12th. She also earned the top rookie honor at that race. Her highest finish was 6th place in 1977, a feat only recently tied by Danica Patrick in 2014. In 1977, she had a new car for the Indianapolis 500 trials, which was faster and gave her the power she needed to qualify on the last day of the trials. Controversy quickly brewed about how the famous starting command, Gentlemen, start your engines, would change to include Guthrie. Speedway management was resistant to change, eventually arguing that it was mechanics that actually started the car that they were all still in. Guthrie's team took umbrage at that, and so assigned Kay Bignotti to operate the car starter. Guthrie has been called a reluctant pioneer for the women's movement, largely because she didn't care so much about the politics of the thing. Still, she found out when she started racing that she became a symbol that other women pointed to, and was especially moved during a parade when she saw men who had little girls on their shoulders and were sort of waving these little girls as if I represented the future. She had come to see the championship of women as a responsibility. She had had at least a potential offer in 1977 to join a better supported team, but ultimately stuck with Volstead because of his loyalty to her, and she later said that she could have driven for a richer team, but not a better team owner. Still, she ended up leaving the team before the 1978 race, and she was unsure that she would be able to compete. She explained on Good Morning America that her prospects looked grim because she couldn't find sponsors. Pressed to figure out why, her own outlook had started to center on a single fact. She was a woman. She would later blame the good old boy network that supported men over women for her and later women racers struggle to find any kind of sponsorships, even with decent racing records. Still, only a month out from the 78 race in Indianapolis, her interview plea had found re receptive ears in Texaco. While most teams had been working for a year, Guthrie, now a team owner, had a month to find a new car, get a team together, and qualify for the Indy 500 for the second year in a row. Against all odds, she put together a crew and found a car. She qualified again with a speed over 190 miles per hour. Then just before the race, she broke her wrist, playing tennis for a benefit. She hid her injury and figured out how to drive a car and shift with a broken wrist, starting in the fifth row. The day her car didn't have serious mechanical problems, and she took an impressive ninth place, ahead of such greats and previous winners, Mario Andretti and Johnny Rutherford. After the 1978 Indy 500, Guthrie seemed to be on the cusp of an incredible racing career, she hadn't yet, but she was sure that she could win races, except that she still had problems with sponsorships. What sponsors she did have wouldn't sponsor more than a handful of races, so she raced infrequently, ultimately only racing in 11 IndyCar events. She qualified again in 1979, but had more bad luck, with her engine's pistings burning out after a handful of laps. She finished in 34th place. When they asked her if she was going to be back in 1980, she already knew that she was in trouble. Without sponsors, this just may be it, she said. For the next four years, she sought sponsorships without success. She did everything she could to find a way to keep racing. In 1983, she finally decided to call it quits, saying that if she kept trying and kept failing, she'd end up jumping out of a high window. Her frustration with the system that she felt kept her from realizing her potential has remained since, and she had repeatedly criticized what she sees as a need for change. In 1987, she told the LA Times that men are getting sponsorships and women can't, despite the fact that a successful woman driver will get ten times the attention that a man will get. She again criticized the boy clubs of male drivers working with male sponsors and the good old boy network. It would be 13 years after the 1979 race that another woman qualified for the Indy 500 when Lynn St. James did so in 1992. For Guthrie, it was always about the racing. She said that she loved a good battle with someone with whom you're equally matched, and said during her time in Indianapolis that she found the constant media attention a continuing source of embarrassment, preferring to be recognized by her ability. 
She was one of the first women elected to the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame in 1980. In 2006, she was inducted into the International Motorsports Hall of Fame. Her helmet and driver suit are in the Smithsonian. After proving herself racing, she won over many of the racers who had balked at her presence on the track. 1983 Indianapolis 500 winner Tom Sneva said Guthrie knew her equipment and how to drive. Legendary NASCAR and IndyCar driver Cale Yarborough said, More power to her. She has made it in what I think is the most competitive racing circuit in the world. Fellow racing legend Mario Andretti said that anyone who says she doesn't belong just feels threatened. 1980 Daytona 500 champion Buddy Baker said in an ESPN article in 2013, When you're out there racing with someone and you see what they're really capable of, they can't help but win you over, especially when you know what they're doing with second-tier equipment and all the BS you had to deal with. I don't care who you are. You have to respect it. ESPN noted that Baker raced against Guthrie for all 33 of her NASCAR starts, finishing ahead of her 20 times, but finishing behind her 13 times. Despite all of it, Guthrie says she wishes she could have done more. I didn't quit willingly, and I didn't accomplish what I felt I could. Janet Guthrie was a pioneer not because she was a crusader, but because she had a passion for what she was doing. She wasn't out there driving to make some sort of point, except, of course, the point that she was as good a driver as anyone. Even when she was facing hostility from the press, she shrugged it off. She told the press that she found the uproar funny, but she was still painfully aware of obstacles she faced, the lack of sponsorships, the poor equipment, the often hostile press and public. She said that extraordinary women have always sought to prove themselves, but their history is often forgotten or denied to exist. So women have to reinvent the wheel. Still, she's made it very clear what she wants to primarily be remembered for as a damn good racing driver. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.